Professor Sandel, thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the interview. Well, thank you. For, it's good to be with you. From the perspective of the political philosopher, um, what aspects of COVID-19 come to your attention? I think the most uh, dramatic lesson uh, about the pandemic, about the character of our society, is that it highlights the deep divisions. Those of us who are able to work from home uh, are relatively safe right. from the COVID virus. Right. Whereas those who have no alternative but to go to work in close proximity to the public, not only in the hospital, but in grocery stores, delivery people, warehouse workers, who are often not rewarded very well for their services. We are depending on them greatly, and yet they are incurring risks that the rest of us have the luxury of avoiding. Many of the people confronting the greatest risks today are the least paid workers. And I think we should learn something from that and, and try to bring about a more equal society, a more fair society in the aftermath. One of the common sayings we hear during this crisis is the saying, we are all in this together. Are we really all in this together? So ideally, the slogan should be true because what it describes, what it gestures toward is the ideal of solidarity, uh, the ideal of the common good. We're all in this together. We are mutually dependent on one another. And therefore, we have to arrange our economy and society in a way that recognizes our mutual dependence. This is the principle of the common good, of, of solidarity, of social cohesion. All countries in the world uh, are facing this coronavirus and fighting against it. And the consequences are different. I think one important important difference is whether there is a strong enough sense of community so that people are willing to approach this crisis in a spirit of shared sacrifice to combat the virus and to promote public health and to seek the common good. Uh, my impression is that in South Korea, one of the reasons for the success compared to other countries is a greater sense of community and of social cohesion. Now, there has been an outpouring of charitable activities in the US and in many European countries, but in South Korea, there's been something that goes beyond philanthropy and charitable activity, but voluntary associations and responses from within civil society, independent of what the government has done. For example, uh, landlords uh, reducing, voluntarily reducing uh, rent for, for businesses, small businesses, for shops and for residents. That's something that is very impressive. And that to someone looking on from the U.S., I greatly admire. You don't see a lot of that here. And um, also uh, consumers, perhaps, being willing to pay in advance to keep small businesses or restaurants going. Uh, uh, this, this is very impressive because it, it arises from within civil society. And it shows a, a common regard and respect and concern for one another. It goes beyond what government alone, even effective government action, can do. You know, against this kind of um, disaster, we have to cooperate with each other. But in fact, a lot of countries initially, they have taken um, the unilateral measure. So this is kind of conflicting situation. This crisis has been a test of the global community. And uh, for the past three or four decades, 
we've been moving in the direction uh, of a kind of global cosmopolitan ethic. But as far as global cooperation, in a moment of crisis, the primary source of security and protection that people reach for instinctively is the nation more than the global community. The nation has reappeared as the primary uh, source of protection for its citizens. And I think that this, this may change the approach to globalization even after this crisis passes. In Korea, government publicized the travelogue of the confirmed patient. Some people say right. that that's infringing um, the privacy and also personal information. Um, right. But some people, other people say that it isn't necessary for the sake of public good. One part of the answer depends on whether the anonymity of the person is maintained. If the uh, location data can be effectively anonymized, then we can get the benefit for public health, notify the people who may have come into contact without revealing the identity of the person. But if it's possible pretty easily to figure out the identity of the people, um, then I think there is a serious privacy concern. Now, maybe even there, we would uh, override that concern for the sake of public health, because this is a matter of life and death. But then it's important to know that we are overriding an important value for the sake of an emergency. And keep that sense of violation close to our consciousness so that when the crisis recedes, we can reassert and enforce the values of privacy that we are temporarily willing uh, to suspend to some degree. What the government and the citizen have to do to prepare for this recurrence of the pandemic? The basis for hope is the possibility that we will learn from this crisis, not only about the public health aspects, but also about the kind of society and the kind of economy, and the kind of politics we, we want to have and need to have in order to give expression to our mutual dependence, to, to make more than a slogan the idea that we are all in this together in a way that creates a, a, a more just societies, societies that recognize the importance of the contributions that everyone makes and that we recognize the sense in which we depend on one another. And from that, I think, can come a greater sense of the common good. That's my hope. And it's a hope that goes beyond medicine, beyond public health, to the moral and civic basis of our common life together. That is just perfect ending of the conversation, I think, Professor Sandel. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed our conversation.